Check this out. All right. Ready? You might you might probably recognize this. Yeah, I recognize those for and sure. Look, it's, <laughs> you it's stole official. it straight from Perry Roubaix. You're allowed to take those, I guess, afterwards. Well, you know, here's the thing. When you train or when you're pre-riding the course, especially as a cyclo sportif rider, I always recommend keeping one of these in your bag. <laughs> just in case. Just in case because, you know, you got to... You never know. I hope you took that after the race passed through and not before. <laughs> right? These things are actually all over the place. So it's like, well, you know, there's three on that post. Maybe they won't notice if they're down right. to two kind of right. thing, right? Yeah, they so, don't need those. <laughs> this is it. All right, Chris, thank, Chris Horner, thanks for joining us once again in studio, live via the internet at PezCyclingNews.com. This week for another fantastic preview, we're talking about, yeah, you said it earlier, the big one, Perry roubaix This is, I think... For for so many people who are fans of the sport, and this is a race un, unlike anything else. I've had the pleasure of riding, in, sort of riding around in the course a couple of times. I made it to the velodrome, uh, not at any speed, I will say, but as a fan and as a rider, the sensations and the feelings of being on a course, which is perhaps the most hallowed of all race grounds in cycling. So Chris Horner, welcome to Pez to talk about Paris Roubaix 2024. Yeah, thanks for having me for another monument here. And this is a big one. It's the end of the Holy Week, right? So I could I have done this Perry Roubaix sections in the Tour de France a couple times. It was always exciting. I had the chance to do it way back with FDJ when we we're in the nineties and stuff. But I I I'd taken a beating. I'd gotten there and, and we went over the forest. And I was so excited. I was going full gas, Richard, through the forest and then just blowing up my teammates and stuff. You know, as a young kid, I was 25 years old, give or take, and, and just blowing it up. And then next thing you know, I'm with my teammates on the next three and four sections and five and six, I'm off the back and seven and eight, I can't find a team. And eight, nine and 10, Mark Mattia, who won here, he won Perry Roubaix twice. He's my director sportif. He's the manager for FDJ now and was then. And he came up to me afterwards. He said, you really want to do this race? And I said, no, I absolutely do not want to do the race. And I jumped on a flight and flew back to my home in Nice and watched it on TV. But as you experienced when you did it as a cycle tourist, it is so fun once you have seen the course and you see the riders go over it because you understand exactly what it's like. A lot of people think it's something like Flanders, but it's not Flanders. Roubaix is the worst of all the pave and cobblestones and all that stuff. This is farmlands out here, and they dropped these rocks, I think, way back in the day, and then never bothered to adjust them again afterwards. I remember, too, as they were reigniting Perry roubaix back sort of in the last 15 or 20 years, they were out searching for new sections of cobbles that, that they could find to add to the race because they, re they realized that that these old cobble roads are actual actually historic monuments in France now and they you know when you ride the course one of the things I really like about Paris Roubaix is that there are those red and white concrete markers at sort of the beginning of each section that with the name of the section on it tells you a little bit of information about it and you know you're on one of the official tracks of of Perry Roubaix. But Chris, let's but before we get too deep into this race, I want to talk sort of about the sensation, the feeling, the emotion around being riding those roads up there in northern France. So I, I remember from myself when I first heard about this race, it was like, what do you, you know, as a, as an early cyclist back in the 80s, this is like, what are you talking about? These guys are racing over over cobblestones it's, uh, and I was I was a mountain biker so I thought this was actually sounded pretty cool and I <laughs> and I thought oh these road guys maybe they're not bad after all you know they're riding on these rough roads but I really had no idea how how like you say how rugged and and unforgiving those cobbles are until I rode them myself but I remember going to see uh Perry Bay 2004 was the first time I went there and getting out of the van sort of starting we started near the beginning of Ehrenberg and we rode from the forest sort of through to the finish line Getting out of the van and, and sort of being on the ground there, I would liken it to stepping onto the field at the Super Bowl or something and realizing that you are on really hallowed ground. It blew me away a little bit and it, and it felt a little emotional too because there was so, there's so much history. There's over 100 years of history on this race. What was it like for you first time getting in there, r riding that stuff? Okay, my very first time, like I said, in the 90s with FDJ, I was up doing the classics. I wasn't on good form at all, but we had, in, in those days in the 90s, the World Tour teams, which were Division One then, they had 
we had 18 riders on FDJ. So when you get this late into the season, all the crashes that the team has had throughout the earlier races, some of those guys have broken arms, some are sick, some have the flu, whatever it happens to be. And so we were down on numbers. And Mark Matteo asked me if I wanted to do Perry Roubaix. And I, I'd always been adamant in the beginning parts of the season to say, no, I don't want to do Roubaix. It doesn't, it doesn't suit me. And to be clear for the viewers, I want to do Perry Roubaix. But as a professional cyclist, I don't want to do Perry Roubaix because I don't want to crash, get hurt, and have my career come to an end. So I looked at it as a professional, as a professional rider looking at his career and trying to extend his career that I didn't think it was good. So I didn't want to go, but we were down, we were down members and, and team guys were out. So Mark Matty asked me to do it. And we, we came down from the classics up North in Belgium. We were pre-riding the course. And I remember in the car as we're, we're going to view the first 100, 150 K in the car. And then we were going to ride the last 100. And, um, as we're, first started going over the cobbles in the car, you realize how long these cobblestone sections are. And it's really like like the Wizard of Oz with the, with the yellow brick road, right? Where it, it, they just roll like this and then, and, and you're on them for kilometers. And so I'm in the car and the car, you can just hear everything, you know. So the suspension's getting slammed left and right. And all of a sudden I start getting a little G'd up and a little excited. And, and like you said, you're on holy ground, right? I'm like, wow, this is really cool. Okay, we, we stop right before Forest of Arnberg and stuff. And I'm super G'd up by the time I get out of the car because, like you said, the holy, the holy pave and all that stuff we've been going over. And I'm super excited. But it does not take long for that excitement to disappear, okay? It really didn't. It took less than probably 45 minutes before that excitement starts to disappear. And you realize that uh, I'm really not in, in my realm here and I shouldn't be here. And so, uh, as I said, when we started off the video, I took a flight back home to Nice and watched it on television. And, and it was marvelous to watch it on TV. And when I got to see it again later and race, the cobblestones later in the Tour de France stages, uh, two times. It, it was quite magical when you come onto the pave. You know, you mentioned something about the, the, uh, I remember this is, there's a, a certain distinct memories that, that stick out for me having seen the race and been standing there on the side of the road when the Peloton comes by. And one of them that, that has, has stuck with me for over a decade is the, waiting for the Peloton to arrive at a section of cobbles, you know, ahead of the race. And, and we observed that there weren't any cars, really. The cars were a long ways ahead of the race. And, and so you couldn't really tell that the race was coming, except the helicopter was up there. So we're like, okay, okay, the race is coming, mm -hmm. the race is coming. It's not like the Tour de France where the caravan comes through and you've got this entire procession that goes on and on for hours, so you know the thing's coming. You're kind of standing there in the field, doo-dee-doo, there's a helicopter. Oh, wait a second. And all of a sudden, you know, the brake comes through and it's like, whoa, jump down, get, get a position, start t shooting some stuff on the camera. But when 180 guys come through and it was like uh, 360 tires pounding on the pave, just like you did, but 360 of those things, like this went on for like, you know, I don't know, 15 or 20 seconds, as long as it took for the Peloton to go by. That sound was unlike anything I've ever heard. And it was, it was amazing. And I'm thinking to myself, Okay, that sounds amazing standing on the side of the road with that, but what's it like if you're in that peloton? Okay, with so those guys. I, it's kind of the same for us. As soon as we get onto the cobblestones, that noise you're talking about, the chain slap, the wheels, the, the brakes, the squealing, all that stuff, sometimes it's the crashes, right? And so we come onto it and we're experiencing the cobblestones a bit like you guys are in terms of the race may have been quiet as as we're coming through some of the towns because all of the fans are on the cobblestone sections. And then all of a sudden you come on the cobblestone sections, all that noise from the bike, you you there's no way you'd be able to hear someone next to you because the fans are so loud screaming and all that. And so it's one big moment the whole present the, the whole time through the cobbles. And then when you come out the cobbles, it just goes quiet. Right. You come out, you make that left, you make that right. And all of a sudden I go quiet because there's just nowhere near the spectators, the amount of spectators that you used to see in everybody's bikes. The noise from the bike dropped down to zero. All of a sudden your bike goes so quiet. You're wondering what's what's wrong with your bike because you're not feeling it vibrating like crazy under your hands and and feet and, and and your butt on the saddle and stuff. And so we kind of experience it the same way you do. But we have to experience every section like that with that big, massive blow up and then it drops. 
and then a big massive blow up and then it drops and then there's the fight coming in and then big massive blow up and then it drops again. So it's special moments. I, I really enjoy doing it, especially in the Tour de France, because then it was uh, we're mixed with GC guys and classic guys. So if, if I like if I went in to go do Perry Roubaix now, they, all these guys are so big and powerful. The fight coming into it's different than it would be at the Tour de France. The Tour de France is a little bit different way to experience and a, probably I would almost guarantee you a little bit calmer way coming onto the cobblestones than what you'll see at the Tour de France or, or than what you'll see at Perry Roubaix on Sunday because a one day race, everybody's fresh, everybody's powerful. All these big guys have fresh legs, fresh muscles, ready to go. They all understand where to be. But the Tour de France is a little bit different because you're dealing with the big guys leading out the little guys into the climb, right? Or sorry, into the pop, into the cobblestones. And so it's a little bit different experience. Talking about these sections of cobblestones that can make or break the race, and there's maybe three or four of them that are really important. And the first one that everybody talks about is the Forest of Arnberg, the Arnberg Trench. It's about two kilometers long, cut straight through the forest. Uh, I've been through a couple of times, and you know the the cobbles are, are the roads peaked like this. There's a there's a crown down the center. It it's it's damp in there. It's there's moss and slippery stuff. Those cobbles are are terrible for traction. It's almost like somebody is going down in in here and they're not going to make it out the other side and it seems like every year that absolutely happens that it's just like a complete crapshoot you don't know you don't know going into that section if you're coming out the other side oh 100 percent. and that's why i skipped doing it in the 90s when mark matteo tapped me on the shoulder after getting dropped on the training ride through there and i'm already on the list to do it right and, and he's tapping me on the shoulder do you want to be here and i i looked at him and that was my thinking all the way as a professional athlete yes i wanted to be there as i said but you know so you know that a lot of guys are crashing and and richard if you crash early it doesn't mean you don't crash late like you could crash in the first cobblestone sections you could crash in the forest and then you can crash when we get into care for section two where where you could guys could crash three times throughout perry roubaix no problem and to be clear i would have done it if i thought i was some kind of favorite to go top 10 or something but but i wasn't going to go top 10 we didn't necessarily have favorites to win it although fdj did win it with uh federic Gidon. what kind of, of rider mentality do you think it takes to really take this race to really get to the top of this race because it is different from just pretty much every other race out there under normal conditions i don't think it takes much because i would have absolutely done it and it wasn't even ideal for me I, it was just yeah, I didn't want to end my career. I wasn't afraid of crashing. I have never been afraid of crashing. The pain of crashing, the broken bones, that doesn't bother me. It's the missed races. It's the missed opportunity. It's the time that I can't go out and train and ride my bike and enjoy riding my bike. That's what I'm trying to avoid. I'm not trying to avoid the pain and suffering. That, that part's meaningless to me. It's no big deal. I was used to it my whole career. But the big guys, when it's normally dry and all that stuff, I don't... I, I, any rider could jump in there and would love to do it. Any professional, I would assume. Uh, there are a few, of course, that you know love to ride at the back and they only ride at the back because they're scared all day. So those guys wouldn't. But aside from the guys riding at the back, um, on normal days, no problem. But let's go back a few years when it was raining and miserable and you have to race it under those conditions. Now, all of a sudden, you're talking about a mentality where when that when that flag drops and the racing starts and it's raining all day long for 265 kilometers... You know, you know, your chances of going down have increased substantially and it could end your cycling career without a doubt. So that that day when I was watching that, sitting on Chesterfield watching it, I'm like, these guys have some guts to get out here and start this race when it's raining and slippery the whole day. In the dry, no problem. But you got good chances of walking out and good chances of controlling the bike. Because remember, when you're crashing a lot of times as a professional, you can control where you put the bike down sometimes. You can't you can't control whether or not if you're going down or not, but you could certainly control like, okay, I can make it over to the grass oftentimes, not every time, but oftentimes you can control your crash. You can slow it down a bit. You can land on a rider. You can land and maybe tag a fan or you could hit the grass. You could, you could have a little bit of control on how you crash. Not all the time, but sometimes you can. So, but in the wet, you know, when the flag drops, you can't control anything from that moment on. So let's go back to a couple of the cobble sections, things that, sections that stood up for you, like the, you know, we get down to the 
into the closing end of the race and you can have a break and it, it can disappear. It could have 30 seconds or a minute and it can be go evaporate like that on these cobbles. They can change so fast on the cobblestones. It's, it's almost like uh, pacing just changes and ebbs and flows unlike uh, different races. What do, you, what do you have to say about that? Well, it, it looks that way because the cobblestones, when you enter the cobblestone, it's, it almost should look, you, you, as a fan sitting on, on the Chesterfield, you got to look at it and go like, as soon as they hit this cobblestone section, it's like the riders hitting a hard climb because the cobblestones slow you down so much. So you're 200 kilometers into the race. You've done a ton of sections of cobbles. You fought for position left and right. And now your legs are starting to get tired. So you come off the road and you, and you hit the cobbles. We as fans, when you're sitting there watching and viewing the race, you see a flat road, but that's not what's really happening. What, what we should almost look at it as is it's a climb, but it's a climb where weight doesn't affect you. But uh, as much as it would if you were just going up Alp Duez or something. But it is the same effect on the pedal in terms of the, how much power has to go up. There, there's no longer, it's not watts per kilo and all that kind of stuff that's mattering a whole lot there. It's just power on the pedals, and that's what the big guys do. And it's the one time where every time you see them enter the cobble, you got to think of it as they're entering the next climb, although it, it's it's not that gra gravity is not having the effect. It's the push of the cobblestones that's ours. So these big guys with these big classic guys with power and lots of muscle, it, it, they don't have gravity slowing them down. But the cobblestones are having that same effect. And so that's where you can see that rider out there. He just blows because it's you got to imagine he hit the climb and he's dead. Or, of course, he gets on the cobblestones. He gets a flat tire. He crashes. His chain skips. His chain drops off the back derailleur. His chain wraps around the rear derailleur, wraps around the front chain ring. Something like that could happen at any moment. That's why we know you got to pay attention all the time because if that rider looks like he's going to win, I mean, we're, I remember seeing it with Inos uh, back in one of the slippery, miserable days. I think it was Moscon that that was putting on a, a show, and then all of a sudden he got a he got a flat. He switched bikes and then he crashed. And and I mean, and, and it, was, it happened that fast. He was up there. You're like, oh man, he might could win this thing, and then has to switch bikes. Oh. Everyone guessed that there was too much air in the tires. We don't know that, but maybe there was. Went through one of the one through one of the corners. He crashed, and the whole race flipped upside down in that one split second of a moment, with the motorcycles crashing before and everything. So anything could happen, especially when it's wet and, and muddy out there. But when it's super dry, these guys can't see anything because the dust is so hot, so much that you're having that problem too. Getting down to the sharp end of this thing, once you hit Carrefour del Arbro, which is, I think, the, about the fourth last section, but really the, the one where we see so many attacks and so much action, the fans are crammed in there, and it's like you're running a gauntlet of screaming fans, like almost maybe a, for you it might be like Alp Duez or something, except you're on the cobbles, right? And so we see this on the television, guys can crash in there, uh, any, anything can happen, but there's always seems to be some kind of an attack that comes in, and I've always wondered to myself, are guys saving something do they have anything left in there or, or how is it possible that at this end of this you're in a group you're going you've got some some jam left to throw down a race winning move at, at this point it's such a hard section oh yeah lots of guys are saving especially back in the day different now because everyone's attacking so much earlier and stuff so uh, they still understand how important that section is first you're trying to survive through the forest and then and then once you get in care for section that's where all the, the big tacks are going and you're trying to win from there. But that was a little bit older generation. Now, now the tacks are coming from wherever they can, right? They're, they're going all over the place. And if you're smart, you, you just got to wait and get some of the favorites outnumbered. Let them re let them reduce the number of the size of the Peloton. And then, and then when they have less teammates, you got to go someplace other than the hardest section of the race. Otherwise, if you're attacking on the hardest section of the race and, and you're not Matthew Vanderpool, Mads Patterson, Maybe Jorgensen, the American rider, too. He's got to be a favorite up here after his ride at, at, at Flanders. It wasn't the most intelligent ride in the world, but he, you know he was really strong. He was the last guy to follow Matthew Vanderpool when he was attacking up to Kulpenberg. So those riders have to find spots to attack where the race slows just for a second, where uh, the numbers are already reduced. Of course, the favorites are have don't have teammates because you want, you want a tactical battle. Otherwise, you can't beat a rider like Matthew Vanderpool if you're attacking – through the most predictable, hardest section of Perry Roubaix. You know, then this kind of leads me to another another tricky section of this race, which is often, I think, overlooked, and that is if you make it to 
the velodrome, now you're on a track. And you've, we've seen this happen where you've got the, the battle's been going on in the cobbles for 255 kilometers, and then they make it to the velodrome. Well, now you're in a track sprint with three or four guys. And it's like, it's a whole new ball game to finish this thing off. Right. I mean, that, that's it's it's and, and now anyone can win. Right. Because most likely, if you look at the race, the favorite was covering and doing most of the work, trying to keep everything together, trying to get away. Then they're bringing them back and then they're and then he's getting attacked and he has to be the one who brings it back. So by the time a small group of five riders get onto the velodrome there, whoever the favorite, i.e. Matthew Vanderpool on this Sunday, there's no doubt about that. He is probably, if he hasn't been able to get away, he has most likely done more work than anyone in the group that he's with. So now all of a sudden he's at a disadvantage, right? We saw that at at Gint Webble again when Mads Peterson beat him in the sprint. Um, After Matthew Vanderpool rode 20 kilometers in the wind, then Mads Peterson was sitting on his wheel the whole time. They get into the finish, Mads Peterson wins, wins the sprint, which... Okay, maybe he should because he's a sprinter, but so is Matthew Vanderpool in, in a, a one-day big classic of that kind of distance. I remember from myself, my own ride, when I made it to the velodrome, I, I pulled in there, I stopped at the entrance of the velodrome, and I just sat there and I took the whole thing in because I was like, now I'm in yet another famous part of this race. Took a super slow lap around the velodrome just to try and soak the whole thing because I didn't know when I was going to come back. But then there's another part of this race that is iconic and unlike anything else, and those are those showers in the clubhouse beside the velodrome. I was lucky enough to actually get a shower in one of those after my <laughs> ride there, and I thought, okay, this is it. You put a pin in me, I'm done. This is a, right. I'm... Yeah, that's it. That's, that's the crowning moment, right? And, and you see the riders after the race. It's almost a, it's much like the Tour de France where it's when the race is done, you can see the riders really taking in the moment. They don't have time to take in the moment as you did throughout the course, um, throughout the cobbles, because they're too focused. It's too much, uh, too much energy is being spent. So, so they don't really have that kind of time to take it in. But once, once the race is over, that's why you see all, all the riders aren't just disappearing back to the bus like they normally would at any other race. They were, they, they finish and they're straight to the bus, right? You can't even find them. If you're pressed, you got to go to their bus because that's where they're going to be. Roubaix is the one time when they're trying to soak in the moment of it. Uh, it, it, And it only happens at Roubaix and then, of course, at Grand Tours. All right. So we've got ourselves kind of from through the cobbles. We've now we've done the track. We've had a shower. We'll talk about the races. You mentioned Matthew Vanderpool, kind of the hands down favorite for this thing. But then again, this race is so wide open. Anything can happen. Who else do you think is going to be there activating this race? Well, it still comes down to Mads Pedersen. He's on good form. There's no doubt about it. I know they blew up, and and Matteo Jorgensen, both those two blew up in Flanders, but they blew up because their tactics were really bad, not because they were bad. Mads Pedersen was exceptional at Flanders. Jorgensen was exceptional at Flanders. They were one and two get coming off of the back wheel of, of Matthew Vanderpool when he's attacking. So we know they're on form. There's no doubt about that. Uh, just their tactics were a nightmare at Flanders. So they need to clean that stuff up. And then there's still number two, number three favorites here with behind Matthew Vanderpool, that is. After that, if you look at Flanders and you watch the whole race, especially near the finish, you see that UAE team members had solid numbers. Niels Palat, of course, leading the guys in to get a podium there at Tour of Flanders after Michael Matthews was relegated for going all the way from the left to the right. And so, but UAE team members had four riders in there. They got to be considered a favorite with those kind of numbers. They're clearly all on form. They're coming in with uh, just, I think, with just one rider switching. Kovi, Kovi's out, and they're bringing in um, their sprinter, Milano. Um, so they got basically the same crew from Flanders, and they went really strong there. So they would highlight my next guys that are that are up there. And everyone else, when you look at Flanders, I think they were just trying to survive. But I, Mads Pedersen, on fantastic form. Jorgensen, the, the American, he's he is our brightest hope for sure. There's no doubt about that on the U.S. side for U.S. fans. Matthew Vanderpool, number one. And then the team as a whole, UAE Emirates, uh, they look solid. And Niels Paulette. I think is on that really, really fantastic form that we've seen him before here at Perry roubaix where we're going to have to keep an eye on Niels Paulette for sure and his whole team. And another stat that may be achieved this weekend is the Flanders Roubaix double, which is not very common. I think that's happened about eight times in the past. Uh, you know, we saw Tom Bonin do it. 
Um, Peter Sagan did it, and but it's you know guys are coming out they're hot on form in Flanders, but this race is so unpredictable that it's it's no easy feat. So, like you say, even though there's somebody a few guys that are really clearly on form, that's not any guarantee necessarily once they hit the cobblestones at Roubaix. No, it's you need luck, right? You, you can't just you need sorry you need good luck. Or you need bad luck not to hit you, which is good luck. So count it however you want, half full or half empty. But you need that for sure. And when something bad happens to you, which is most likely going to, you have to be, the team has to prepare the night before to understand what will happen when we get into Roubaix. If you look at a team like Alpacine de Kunic, they didn't have um, Jasper Phillips in there at Tour of Flanders, which I thought was an amazing idea to pull their sprinter out of Tour of Flanders. I didn't see any reason to have him on the roster going into Flanders and confuse the objective that the team had or have one less rider sitting back on, on the climbs trying to trying to hope there's going to be a sprint at the finish. Now we have Jasper Phillips in on the team, and they didn't list their whole roster, so I can't tell you their whole team. But at, there at Flanders, they they did a fantastic job of staying together, of not panicking. And what Matthew Vanderpool did at Tour of Flanders when he's getting on the radio with 91 kilometers to go and 98 kilometers to go to figure out what's happening, where his team is, calm the race down for a second, get his team to the front, and then control the peloton again. That's what you have to do, Richard, when a bad moment hits. A bad moment hits, you have to have your team around you, and you have to remember and think, okay, uh, let's say he attacked through the forest, he split everything up, he has no teammates, but he's got five, a group of five or a group of ten riders with him, and he flats in the next cobblestone section. He's got to hope and know the director has to be feeding him information. Matthew, you, we have four guys in the next group of 20 or 25 behind you. If you flat and they're 10 seconds behind you by the time you get the wheel change or the bike change, wait for your four teammates and then have your four teammates Go on to the front, just like we experienced at Flanders. That's what he did. He didn't flat, but he knew he was in trouble. He knew he would have to expend a lot of energy. He knew he's 90 kilometers out. If he goes back up to that front group, he's in trouble. So if you just sit back and your team director is, is doing a marvelous job, a lot of times in bike racing, these guys forget to think about what's happening behind them because what's happening behind you can still get you back up to the front if they're all your teammates, right? The only, there's only one way to find out how this thing's going to go. <laughs> tune in and watch. And you better enjoy And, and you got to basically tune in for the whole thing, right? There's no yeah. doubt about it, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Yeah, of course, as as the viewers hopefully know, I have the channel The Butterfly Effect where we're covering the bike races daily, all the big, race, big bike races, the World Tour races. And then beyond the coverage, I, I like to talk about stuff that's happening between the races. So it's up there most days. We have 700 videos already listed up in the last three years or three and a half, something like that. And I, I lay in. If they're good, if they're good, I tell how good they are. If they're bad, I tell you how bad they are. And hopefully I tell good stories and hopefully I'm entertaining you guys when you're watching the butterfly effect too. So um, as I always say, like and subscribe to Pez because we're here. And then like and subscribe, of course, to the butterfly effect when you flip over for some more cycling content. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks very much. And don't forget, uh, Pez fans, we have previews running every day this week. We've got our, our official Pez preview is on site right now, in addition to this. So tune in to the main website uh, every day from now until race day. And even after that, we're going to have some more, some great follow-up coverage, big photos, full race report, analysis, breakdown. And then you can check out Chris for his in-depth take at this thing, which nobody else will have at all. So, all right, Chris, thanks again so much for talking with us uh, for another fantastic preview. It's going to be a, a really another good weekend in April. Into the Holy Week. We know it's going to be good. Like yeah. and subscribe, guys. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Richard.